Hey guys, um, it's Willing Away and welcome back to Through the Parks. So it has been quite a bit since I have covered one. Um, we're covering Grand Teton uh, today, Grand Teton National Park. And uh, I'm not going to lie, this one's going to be quite a long one. It is 17 pages of <laughs> research. Um, so I guess I don't get ready. Uh, I'm going to try going through this relatively quickly. Um, since there is so much to cover, but yeah, I'm excited. This is going to be so, th this is so much. Okay. But yeah, so obviously we're going to do it like always where we go over like our overall info, stuff like that. Um, you know, geology, ecology, um, oh shit, like recreational activities, stuff like that. We're just going to cover that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah. So I'm just going to get started before I waste more time, and then we can talk about stuff at the end that I want to cover, but yes. Alright, so Grand Teton is located in northern, uh, western Wyoming. The park contains roughly 310,000 acres, and the major peaks um, of the 40 mile Teton range, um, as well as some of the sections of Jackson Hole, are also included into the park. So, Grand Teton is only 10 miles south of Yellowstone, and they are connected by a highway called the John D. Rockefeller Jr. Memorial Parkway. Along with other national forests, the protected area covers almost 18 million acres of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and the human history in the Grand Tetons dates back almost 11,000 years ago, when the first nomadic hunter-gatherer Paleo-Indians migrated to the region. Uh, during the warmer months for more food and supplies. So in the early 19th century, the first explorers encountered the Eastern Shoshone natives. And then from 1810 to 1840, the region would attract fur trading companies and U.S. expeditions would eventually start in the mid 19th century um, as like kind of like a shoot off of the Yellowstone explorations that were happening. So the first permanent white settlers arrived uh, in Jackson Hole in the 1880s. However, the efforts to preserve the area would only start in the late 19th century, and then in 1929, the Grand Teton National Park would be established. So, the valley of Jackson Hole uh, would remain a private residence until the 1930s, when John D. Rockefeller Jr. would eventually purchase the land and then add it into the existing parks. So, although the public... Um, and multiple different repeals through Congress tried to stop, uh, like, try to stop it, try to stop Rockefeller from purchasing this land and putting it into the park. Much of Jackson Hole would eventually be set aside as the Jackson Hole Monument in 1943. This monument was eventually abolished in 1950, and the land was then given to the Grand Teton National Park. So, Grand Teton is named after the tallest mountain in the range, and the name of the mountains was due to uh, early 19th century uh, French-speaking trappers. Originally, this is going to be French, so I might butcher it, uh, it was Les Trois Tetons, meaning uh, the three teats, but was later shortened to Tetons. So, at 13,775 feet, Grand Teton sharply rises more than 7,000 feet above the Jackson Hole Valley. Uh, that is almost 850 feet higher than Mount Owen, which is the second highest summit in the range. So the park includes many different lakes, including the Jackson Lake, which is 15 miles long, along with many streams and then the upper mainstream of the Snake River. Dozens of small gra glaciers uh, at higher elevations, um, well, dozens of small glaciers are at higher elevations near the highest peaks in the range. And the park also has the oldest rocks, some dating almost 2.7 billion years ago. Uh, it is a pristine ecosystem, which means that the same species that were found there years ago can still be found in the park. There are over a thousand species of vas vascular plants, dozens of mammals, 300 species of birds, a few dozen fish species, and then a few like reptiles and amphibians in the park. Due to various problems, efforts have been made to enhance protection for some of the uh, species of fish and the White Pine Park, which we talked about a little bit in the Yellowstone. Um, the park is relatively known for mountaineering, hiking, fishing, and different other activities. There are more than 1,000 <laughs> driving campsites and 200 miles of hiking trails. Um, those hiking trails also give access to the backcountry camping areas. 
Um, it is also known for renowned trout fishing and is one of the only places to catch Snake River fine spotted cut dirt trout. Um, the park includes several different National Park Service's ran visitor centers and also privately operated concessions that would just include like your motels, your lodges, gas stations, and then marinas. And that's it for overall information. Kind of like a quick overview about the park, some little facts, some little history, just to kind of tell you uh, a little bit about Grand Teton. Now we're going to get into one of the longer parts, which is the human history. So we're going to start off with the Paleo Indians and Native Americans history, and then just kind of go down the timeline from there. We're starting all the way from the back, going uh, to the present, basically. So Paleo Indians' presence in the park dates back to more than a thousand years ago, uh, like we mentioned in the overall information. The Jackson Hole climate back then was way colder and more alpine than the climate we have today. Um, and since the first humans were generally migra uh, migratory hunter and gatherers, that just means like they migrate. Um, they would spend summer months in Jackson Hole, and then during the winter months, they would go to like the areas west of the Teton Range. So around the shores of Jackson Lake, there have been found many different things like fire pits, tools, uh, and what is to believe to be like fishing weights. Um, one of the tools is believed to be associated with the Clovis culture and dates back roughly at least 11,500 years ago. And some of the tools were obsidian, which would have been found near what is uh, today Teton Pass or just south of the park. And although there was obsidian in Jackson Hole, almost all obsidian, um, all of the obsidian found has been sourced uh, from the south. And this just kind of proves that they were migratory and that was the route they kind of followed was from the south up. So elk, which are found in the National Elk Refugee, or Refuge, yeah. So in the National Elk Refuge, uh, elk still have that similar migratory pattern, so we can kind of tell exactly how they migrated due to what the elk follow still today. So from 11,000 to 500 years ago, there was no evidence that this pattern of migration ever changed, and no evidence of any permanent human settlements in the park. Eventually, white American colonists would enter the region in the 19th century, uh, and that is when they would encounter the eastern tribes of the Shoshonan people. Um, most of these Shoshonan that lived in the mountain region would remain as like pedestrians, so they would usually just walk to get every everywhere, while um, very few, usually in lower elevations, would have uses of horse, but it was very limited use. Um, the mountain living Shoshonan were also known as um, they were given the name sheep eaters, or what they would call themselves, um, I'm going to mispronounce this, I'm so sorry, uh, Tuku, Tukutika? Uh, and since the staple, and those do the fact that their staple of their diet was the bighorn sheep. Um, eventually, the Shoshonans would still continue to use the same migratory uh, pattern and are said to have a very close spiritual relationship with the Tian range. Several of the stone enclosures on the parks that can be found near the peaks are believed to have been used by the Shoshonans during what is called vision quests. Um, a vision quest is kind of like seen as like a rite of passage in some Native American cultures. Eventually, the Teton and the Yellowstone Shoshonan were relocated to the Wind River Native American Reservation in 1868. Um, and then the land that is 100 miles southeast of Jackson Hole. So it was, it was selected by Chief um, Washaki. And that is the end of our Paleo Indians and Native Americans histories. Now we're going to get into what was kind of really popular at the time too for the Teton Range, which is the fur trade exploration. This was very popular. Um, it got really big. <laughs> it blew up over there. And so this is kind of one of the important histories too. So the Loost and Clark expedition would eventually pass through the Teton Range um, on their way to the Pacific Ocean. Eventually, one of their expedition members, John Coulter, would ask to be uh, discharged early from the expedition so that he could go and join two trappers who were heading west uh, to find beaver, pellet, or beaver pelts. He would, um, Coulter, the one who left, would eventually uh, be hired by Manuel Lisa, and that would be to start leading fur trappers um, and to start exploring what is the Yellowstone River. In 1807 to 1808, during winter, Coulter was said to have passed through Jackson Hole 
and that would be a, like kind of like the first Caucasian to see the Teton Range. So William Clark, who was the co-leader in the Lewis and Clark expedition, would produce a map with Coulter's exploration in 1807. Basically, um, Clark and Coulter would have a discussion in St. Louis, uh, Missouri in 1810, and that would lead to Coulter's exploration of the Teton Range in 1807 to be added to said map. So another map by William would show that Coulter had entered the Jackson Hole from what is the northeast section, eventually crossing the Continental Divide at either Tugwadi uh, Pass or Union Pass, and then would leave the region after crossing Teton Pass and following um, well-established Native American trails. In 1931, eventually it was found that there was a rock that was carved in the shape of a head. It had the ins uh, inscription John Coulter on one side and the year 1808 on the other. This was found in Tetonia, Idaho, which is just west of the Teton Range. This stone, which is called the Coulter Stone, was never has never been authenticated to be, you know, created by Coulter, um, and it is believed to be from other expeditions to the region that someone created this and left it there. So Coulter is widely believed to be what is considered the first mountain men, um, like many others in the region. Basically, they would just be there primarily for what is the profitable fur trapping business. The region was very rich with beaver and other fur-bearing animal pelts and would eventually uh, lead a lot of fur companies to arrive there. So from 1810 to 1812, the PFC, also called the Pacific Fur Company, would travel through Jackson Hole and the Teton Pass as they were heading east. Eventually, after 1810, the British and American fur companies were fighting over uh, the North American fur train basically trying to be the number one to secure it. Um, the region was not secured until the Oregon Treaty in 1846 for the American fur companies, and eventually one group employed by the British Northwest Company and led by Donald Mackenzie would enter Jackson Hole from the West in 1818 or 1819. Uh, it was one of those years. So the Tetons and Pierre's Hole, which is just west of the Teton Range, um, are believed to have been named by French-speaking, uh, I, ooh, I'm gonna have a little hard time pronouncing this, Iroquois, or French Canadians that were part of Mackenzie's group, were believed to have, uh, named these areas. Earlier groups, uh, eventually were just referred to the peaks in the range as the Pilot Knobs, <laughs> and the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, which was formed in the mid-1820s, would eventually have a partnership with Jedediah Smith, William Sublet, David Edward Jackson, um, or also known as Davy Jackson. Eventually, Jackson would oversee this trapping operation in the Teton Range. This was between the years of 1826 to 1830. Um, Sublet, one of the um, people in the partnership, would eventually name the valley to be Jackson's Hole uh, for Davy Jackson. As the demand slowly would decline, uh, for fur trapping, the American West was very depleted due to over trapping, and that would lead most of the American fur trading companies to fold, leaving just individual mountain men to continue to trap until like the 1840s. And from the mid 1840s to 1860s, Jackson Hole and the Teton Range were devoid of all small populations of Native American tribes, and most overland. Human migration routes like the Oregon and Mormon trails would cross over the South Pass, um, and then after that, Caucasian influence on the Teton Range was minimal until the U.S. government started to organize explorations to investigate uh, the Teton Range and stuff like that. And that is it for the fur trapping history. Kind of specific, you know, kind of easy. They kind of blew up, and then like any other business decline fell, and so they would eventually just leave. Now we get into the organized exploration and settlement of the area. So the first U.S. government-sponsored expedition would start in 1859 to 1860, and it was the first ever one to enter Jackson Hole. Uh, it was named the Reynolds Expedition. There were three main crew members of this expedition. There was the U.S. Army Captain William F. Reynolds, Mountain Man Jim Bridger, and naturalist F. B. Hayden, who would lead other expeditions to the area. 
This expedition was originally tasked to explore Yellowstone, but due to winter snow, uh, there ended up being problems. So eventually Bridger would end up going through what is called Union Pass uh, to Gross Venture River, eventually to the Snake River, and then finally they would leave uh, the region through what is the Teton Pass. Exploration was eventually paused during Civil War uh, and then picked back up with what is uh, known as the Hayden Geological Survey of 1871. In 1872, Hayden would lead the Yellowstone Exploration uh, and eventually his other division, led by um, James Stevenson, would explore Teton Range. Stevenson's group would have um, a photographer named William Henry Jackson, and he would be the first to take photos of the Teton Range. The Hayden Geological Survey would name most of the mountains and lakes in the area, um, and then early explorations of the area would eventually fail to prove any sources of viable mineral wealth, so there was nothing really there for uh, prospectors to want. However, this wouldn't stop anybody from setting up small claims and mining operations throughout the small creeks and rivers of the area. By the 1900s, all of these efforts were eventually abandoned, obviously because there was no viable mineral wealth, so it was kind of like hopeless. Um, the Teton Range was never ever like permanently inhabited, but the Jackson Hole Valley had some pioneers settle down. This would happen in 1884. These early homesteaders were mostly single men who would endure the long winters and then the very short growing seasons. Uh, and would experience very rocky soils that were very hard to cultivate. Instead of plants, the region was very suitable for uh, growing hay and cattle ranching. And by the 1890s, the Jackson Hole would eventually have a population of 60. So Menner's Ferry would be built in 1892 uh, near what is now today Moose, Wyoming. The ferry was built to help provide access for wagons to the west side of the Snake River. Ranching would eventually increase from the 1900s to the 1920s, uh, but a very unfortunate series of economic downturns in the early 1920s left many of the ranchers destitute. And then in the 1920s, automobiles would provide very fast and easier access to the area, and in response would help create an increase in tourism, uh, which would eventually lead to the development of what is called dude ranches. Uh, these were established so that urbanized travelers could experience what is considered the life of a cowboy. Uh, so yeah, that would be kind of what the tourism in the area is like. Now we get on to the most exciting part, my favorite, the establishment of the park. So since Yellowstone had been established in 1872, many conservationists wanted to expand the boundary of this park to include uh, the Teton Range. In 1907, Due to an effort to help regulate water flow, the U.S. Bureau of Re Re Reclamation would construct a crib dam at the Snake River by Jackson Lake. <clears throat> in, 18, uh, in 1910, this dam would fail, and eventually a concrete dam was built in 1911. So, part of the Minidoka project was meant to help provide irrigation in the state of Idaho. Um, due to these dams, more construction plans were put in place to help build more. However, Horace Albright Yellowstone, or Horace Albright, which is Yellowstone's superintendent, would eventually, like, uh, seek out to start blocking these efforts. Uh, this would lead residents of Jackson Hole to, they didn't really want Yellowstone to expand. Instead, what they favored was that a whole new national park would be built, and this would include the Teton Range and the six other lakes in the area. Eventually, congressional approval, um, or eventually after congressional approval, President Calvin Coolidge would sign the order which would establish the 96,000-acre Grand Teton National Park. This would happen on February 26, 1929. Um, in the 1920s, John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his wife would eventually visit Jackson Hole. Um, and this was at the time where it was primarily in private ownership. Horace Albright and Rockefeller would eventually discuss ways on how to start to preserve Jackson Hole, and eventually Rockefeller would start buying these properties throughout Jackson Hole, um, and he would buy them through what is called the Snake River Land Company, and eventually later turn them over to the National Park Service. In 1930, his plan was revealed to buy out this area and give it to the National Park Service, 
and many other many of the residents would eventually like very strongly disapprove of this so congressional efforts would also um be put in effect to try to stop the grand teton from expanding but the snake rivers landing company uh well congressional efforts to stop the grand teton from exam expanding would put rockefeller's uh snake rivers land company in a sort of limbo they had all this land but um congressional efforts to stop it from expanding would make sure that he couldn't give it to the national park service to expand the park by 1942 rockefeller got very impatient and he was very worried that uh the land would never be given to the park he would eventually write to the secretary of the interior harold l ikes and he would tell him that he was considering to sell this land give it away basically ikes would eventually go and recommend uh that prince or that president franklin roosevelt please to use the uh, uh, oh my god hold on ikes would eventually recommend that president uh, franklin roosevelt use the antiques act to establish a national monument in jackson hole roosevelt would create the jackson hole monument in 1943 and it would consist of about 221,000 acres uh and this would include the land donated by Rockefeller and eventually would add ones from the Teton National Forest. So the park and monument were next to each other, but the monument would ensure that no funding would be given or no level of resource protection um, equal to what the park was receiving. This caused members of Congress to uh, try to get this new monument abolished and then at the end of World War II, national public sentiment was in favor of adding the monument to the park, and eventually the monument and the park were combined in 1950. In recognition of Rockefeller's efforts to help protect the land of Jackson Hole and stuff like that, uh, they would expand the Grand Teton National Park, another 24,000 acres of land, and this would be between Grand Teton and Yellowstone in 1972. This land, and eventually the road that was built there, would be called the John D. Rockefeller Jr. Memorial Parkway. And it was also, fun fact, the Rockefeller family owned what is called the JY Ranch. This would border Grand Teton, and then in November 2007, the Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family would transfer ownership to the park and eventually establish the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Preserve, and it was dedicated on June 21st of 2008. And that's kind of about it for the park's establishment. Now we're going to get into what is uh, another cool history I liked that I, I thought I would just include here because I find it very interesting, which is the history of mountaineering. So the last 25 years of the 19th century, the mountains of the Teton Range would eventually become like a focal point for explorers that wanted to be the first to climb the peaks. However, fun fact, Many of these explorers were not actually the first to even ascend the mountain peaks, and it's possible that the very first ascents of the peaks were done way before written history ever existed. Native American relics have been found on top of these mountain peaks or near the summits. The enclosure is a really big one. It's a human-made structure located just 530 feet below the summit of Grand Teton, near what is called the Upper Saddle. Nathan P. Langford and James Stevenson both members of what it was the Hayden Geological Survey in 1872, would find the enclosure on their attempt to summit Grand Teton. Uh, Langford would claim that they had climbed the Grand Teton, but didn't know if they ever made it to the summit. Um, however, their reported obstacles and sightings never got verified by any other party, and it was believed to like, be that they never actually made it past the enclosure. Um, Due to the fact that some of the sightings they were stating just was never found. Eventually, the first ascent that was ever verified was made by William O. Owen, Frank Peterson, John Shiv, and Franklin Spencer Spaulding. This would occur on August 11th, 1898. Owen uh, originally had made two attempts previously, um, and he would discredit any belief that Langford had ever actually made it to the summit. This disagreement actually is believed to, uh, about, like, who made it to the top, is, can be believed to be one of the, uh, greatest controversies in American mountaineering. 
Um, and then after 1898, no other ascents of the Grand Teton were ever recorded until 1923. And by the mid-1930s, more than a dozen different climbing routes had already been established, including the North Northern East Ridge in 1931 by Glenn Exum. Uh, Glenn Exum and Paul Petzold would eventually team up and found what is called the Exum Mountain Guides in 1931. And then eventually all other major peaks in the area were all climbed by the late 1930s. Mount Morin would eventually be climbed in 1922, and Mount Owen would be climbed in 1930 by Friedhof Fryaxel and others uh, after many different failed attempts. Middle and South Teton were climbed on the same day by a group of climbers led by Albert R. Ellingwood. This would happen in August 29th, 1923. Eventually, new routes were explored uh, as the safety equipment and skills improved, and rock climbing and bouldering would become popular by the mid-20th century. In the late 1950s, John Gill would be the first gymnast to use what is uh, called gymnast chalk to improve handholds and to keep hands dry while climbing. And then in the mid-1990s, over 800 different climbing routes had been documented uh, for the peaks and canyon cliffs. And yeah, that was all for um, the history. We, we covered it all. We're done. Now we get into just some small stuff that I thought was important and kept note of. This is going to be like park management, geography, ecology, all of those ones. But you guys kind of have the history right now. If that's all you're interested in, there you go. Um, but we're going to get into the park management and continue our way from there. So Grand Teton is one of the top 10 most visited parks in the U.S. and usually has an average of 2.75 million visitors ranging from 2007 to 2016. Uh, in 2016, it had 3.27 million visitors. Um, the, te uh, the National Park, Grand Teton National Park, has an average of 100 permanent and 180 seasonal employees. Um, the park also manages over 27 different concession contracts. That includes like your lodging, your restaurants, mountaineering, guides, dude ranching, fishing, and boat shuttles. Construction of an airstrip north of the town was completed in the 1930s, and due to the eventual creation of Jackson Hall as a monument, the airport was left in the park, and it is technically the only commercial airport in a national park. Due to it being inside of a national park, the airport has very strict rules on the noise that can be created and how you actually are supposed to fly into the national park. As of 2010, 110 different privately owned properties are in Grand Teton National Park. There are efforts to purchase these lands, uh, and they're still ongoing. They hope to raise at least $10 million to acquire these private areas to eventually be added to the park. In December 2016, the Antelope Flats parcel, which would consist of 640 acres, was purchased and transferred to the park. And the purchase price of this area was $46 million dollars and that money will be used to help benefit Wyoming public schools. As of now, many private lands are still trying to be bought and confined into the park, but those efforts are ongoing and just wait to be seen. And that is all for right now of park management. We're going to get into one of the interesting uh, subjects I enjoy, which is the geography of the area. So basically, think of it like your mountains, your lakes, that kind of stuff. So. The Jedediah Smith Wilderness of Caribou Targhee National Forest lies along the western boundary and includes the western slopes of the Teton Range. To the northeast of this area and east lie the Teton Wilderness and Gross Venture Wilderness of Bridger Teton National Forest, and the National Elk Refuge, uh, Refuge is to the southeast. Privately owned land borders the park to the south and southwest, um, and Grand Teton National Park along with Yellowstone National Park uh, and surrounding national forests constitute to the 18 million acre Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. The Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem spans the portion of three different states and is one of the largest intact mid-latitude ecosystems that remain on Earth. And then by road, Grand Teton National Park is 290 miles from Salt Lake City, Utah and 550 miles from Denver, Colorado. That is kind of like the overall information of the geography. Now we're going to get into the specifics. For this one, we're going to be spoke, uh, focusing on the Teton Range first, and then we'll get into like the Jackson Hole and the other areas. So 
The Teton Range would begin forming uh, between 6 and 9 million years ago. It would run roughly north to south and rises from the floor of the Jackson Hole without any foothills along a 40 mile long by 7 to 9 miles wide active fault block mountain front. The range tilts westward, rising abruptly above Jackson Hole Valley, which lies to the east, and then more gradually into the Teton Valley to the west. <clears throat> a series of earthquakes along the Teton Fault would slowly displace uh, the western side of the fault upward and the eastern side of the fault downward. Most of the displacement of the fault occurred in the last 2 million years, and while the fault has experienced up to 7.5 earthquake magnitude events since it was formed, it is relatively uh, quiet. Um, it hasn't done much. It only has a few five-point magnitude or greater earthquakes known to have occurred since 1850. In addition uh, to the 13,775 13, foot high Grand Teton, another nine peaks are over 12,000 feet above sea level. Eight of these peaks between uh, Avalanche and Cascade Canyons make up the often photograph uh, photographed Cathedral Group. The most prominent peak north of Cascade Canyon is the monolithic Mount Moran, which is 5,725 feet above Jackson Lake. To the north of Mount Moran, the range eventually merges into the high-altitude Yellowstone Plateau. South of the central cathedral group, the Teton Range tapers off near Teton Pass and blends into the Snake River Range. West to east, Trenton Canyons provides easier access by foot into the heart of the range, um, as no vehicles uh, traverse the range except at Teton Pass, which is south of the park. And then, covered by a combination of different glacier activity as well as numerous streams, the canyons at their lowest point are, are at their lowest point along the eastern margin of the range at Jackson Hole. Flowing from higher to lower elevations, the glaciers would help create more than a dozen different U-shaped valleys throughout the range. Uh, Cascade Canyon is sandwiched between what is known as Mount Owen and Tiwanot Mountain to the south and Cemetery Spire to the north, and is situated immediately west of Jenny Lake. Uh, north to south, it goes Webb, Morin, Paintbrush, Cascade, Death, and Granite Canyons slice through the Teton Range. And that is it for the Teton Range. Now we're going to focus on the Jackson Hole. So Jackson Hole is a 55 mile long by 6 to 13 miles wide Garbin Valley with an average elevation of 6,800 feet. Its lowest point is near the southern park boundary at 6,350 feet. The valley sits east of the Teton Range and is vertically displaced downward 30,000 feet, making the Teton Fault and its parallel twin on the east side of the valley normal faults, with the Jackson Hole block being the hanging wall and the Teton Mountain block being the foot wall. Jackson Hole is comparatively flat, with only a modest increase in altitude south to north. However, a few isolated buttes, such as Blacktail Butte and Hills, including Signal Mountain, dot the valley floor. In addition to a few outcroppings, the Snake River has eroded ter uh, terraces into Jackson Hole, and southeast of Jackson Lake, glacial depressions known as kettles are numerous, and these kettles were formed when ice situated underneath gravel outwash from ice sheets melted as the glaciers retreated. So we have two more sections. These are going to be general. These, uh, the next one we're going to be covering is our lakes and rivers. And then after that, we'll be covering uh, the glacier, the glacian, or the glacian, glacian, glaciers. We're going to be covering glaciers. <laughs> so let's focus on the lakes and rivers. So most of the lakes in the park were formed by glaciers, and the largest of these lakes are located at the base of the Teton Range. In the northern section of the park lies what is called Jackson Lake, which is the largest lake in the park at 15 miles in length, 5 miles wide, and 438 feet deep. East of the Jackson Lake Lodge lies Emma, Matilda, and Two Oceans Lakes. South of Jake's, uh, Jackson Lake lies Leia, Jenny, Bradley, Taggart, and Phelps Lakes. Uh, these rest at the outlets of the canyons, which lead into the Teton Range. Lake Solitude, which is located at an elevation of 9,035 uh, 9, feet, is in a, cir a circuit at the head of the northern fork of Cascade Canyon. Other high altitude lakes can be found at over 10,000 feet in elevation, and a few such as Ice Flow Lake remains unclogged or ice clogged for much of the year. The park is not noted for any large waterfalls, however, there is a 100-foot-high Hidden Falls just west of Jenny Lake, 
and it is very easy to reach uh, after a very short hike. The Snake River flows north to south through the park. It enters towards Jackson Lake near the boundary of Grand Teton National Park and John D. Rockefeller Jr. Memorial Parkway. The Snake River then flows through the spillages, spillways of the Jackson Lake Dam and from there southward through Jackson Hole, exiting the park just west of the Jackson Hole Airport. The largest lakes in the park all drain uh, either directly or by tributary uh, streams into the Snake River. Major tributaries which flow to the Snake River would include the Pacific Creek and Buffalo Fork near Morin and the Gras Venture River at the southern border of the park. Through the comparatively level Jackson Hole Valley, the Snake River descends an average of 19 feet per mile, while other streams descending from the mountains to the east and west have higher gradients due to increased slopes. The Snake River creates braids and channels in sections where the gradients are lower and in steeper sections erodes and undercuts the cobblestone terraces once deposited by the glaciers. Now we get into uh, the gla Glacian, I believe that's how it's pronounced, uh, so glaciers. So the peaks of the Teton Range were all ca carved by glaciers. 250,000 to 150,000 years ago, the Tetons would experience different periods of glaciation, some like Jackson Hole being 2,000 feet thick. During the Pine Dell glaciation, the landscape visible today was created as glaciers in the Yellowstone Plateau. This would flow south and eventually form G the Jackson Lake, uh, while the smaller glaciers descending from the Teton Range would push rock warrants out from the canyons and left behind many different lakes near the base of the mountains. Approximately there was a dozen glaciers that currently exist in the park. Um, these are not ancient as they were all reestablished sometime between 1400 and 1850 AD during what is called the Little Ice Age. Of these recent glaciers, the largest is called the Teton Glacier. It sits below the northeast face of Grand Teton. It is 3,500 feet long and 1,100 feet wide. Um, and nearly surrounded by all the tallest summits in the range. The Teton Glacier is also the best studied glacier in the range, and researchers concluded in 2005 that the glacier could disappear in 30 to 75 years. West of the Cathedral Group near Hurricane Pass, a schoolroom glacier is very tiny, but has very well-defined terminal and lateral moraines, uh, a small proglacial lake, and other typical glacial features near each other. And that is all for our glaciers. Now we get into roughly my favorite section of all of these park, your ecology, so your flora, your fauna, all that kind of stuff. These are my favorite, favorite parts to research and look at. I just love everything about them. So we're gonna get into our flora first, and then we will move to, I believe, our fauna next. So the Grand Teton National Park and roughly the surrounding areas host over 1,000 species of vascular plants. With an altitude range of over 7,000 feet, the park has different, like just a ton of different ecological zones. These would include alpine tundra, the Rocky Mountain subalpine zone, um, the valley floor, and other areas. So the Rocky Mountain subalpine zone has your spurs fir forests, uh, the valley floor has a mix of conifer and uh, decadus frost or forest zone occupies um, the region, and it also has better soils that are intermixed with sagebrush plains atop alluvial deposits. So additionally, wetlands near some of the lakes uh, and the valley floor adjacent to the rivers and stream cover very large expanses, especially along the Snake River near what is called Oxbow Bend. This is near Moron and Willow Flats near the Jackson Lake Lodge. So altitude, available soils, wildfire inc incidences, and avalanches, along with human activities, have a very direct impact on the types of plant species in the immediate area of the park. The range of altitude in Grand Teton National Park helps impact the type of plant species found at, varied in at various elevations. So in the alpine zone above the tree line, tundra conditions uh, usually are found. Um, in this area, Hundreds of species of different grass and wildflower, moss, and lichen are found. In the subalpine region, which is the tree line of the base of the mountains, white bark pine, limber pine, subalpine fir, uh, and angleman spruce are dominant. And then on the valley floor, lodgepole pine is the most common, 
but there is Rocky Mountain Douglas fir and blue spur, uh, spruce that inhabit the drier areas. Um, aspen, cottonwood, alder, and willow are more commonly found around the lakes and streams and wetlands of the park. However, the tablelands above the Snake River Channel are mostly sagebush plains and in terms of acreage are the most widespread habitat in the park. The sagebush plains are, uh, or flats have a hundred different species of grasses and wildflowers. Um, the slightly more elevated areas of the plains uh, north of the Jackson Hole would form what is called forest islands, uh, one of these being Timbered Island. Forested islands surrounded by the sagebrush provide different shelter for various different animal species during the day and nearby grasses for nighttime foraging. Uh, the flora in the Grand Teton National Park is generally considered healthy, however the white bark pine um, and sometimes the lodgepole pine are considered at risk. Uh, for the white bark pine, we had talked about this a little bit before, there's an invasive species uh, of fungus known as white pine blister that helps uh, affect the trees. This doesn't absolutely just kill the tree, it just helps to weaken it so that the mountain pine beetles will eventually kill it. So the invasive species of fungus itself isn't the killer, it mainly just weakens the plant too much to the point where other insects eventually wipe it out. White bark pines generally thrive at elevations that are above 8,000 feet and they help produce very large seeds that are high in fat content and are considered a very important food source for various different species uh, of animals such as your grizzly bear, your red squirrel, and Clark's nutcracker. So the species, uh, the white bark species, is considered to be a keystone and a foundation species. It generally has a lower uh, incidence of blister rust infection throughout the greater, uh, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem than in other regions, such as the Glacier National Park and the Cascade Range. The incidence of blister ru rust on whitebark pines in the Yellowstone National Park is slightly lower than in Grand Teton. And though, uh, obviously like we said before, the blister rust does not kill it itself, it really does weaken the trees so that the native pine beetles can more easily infest the trees and kill it. And while generally the practice in most national parks is to allow nature to take its course, um, the alarming trend of increased disease and mortality of the white bark pine has increased a collaborative effort amongst various different government entities uh, to help intervene and protect the, these species of trees. Now we get into fauna, so these are going to be like your animals. My, oh, this is one of my favorite ones. I love all the animals. I love learning about which ones are in the park. So there are 61 species of mammals that have been recorded in the Grand Teton National Park. These would include the gray wolf, which was, uh, what is it, kind of like <laughs> kicked out uh, in the n early 1900s, uh, but eventually would migrate into the Grand Teton National Park after Yellowstone National Park reintroduced wolves to them, to theirs. So the reestablishment of the wolves um, has, you know, ensured that every indigenous mammal species now exists in the park. So like I said before, um, it is one of those parks where everything that used to live there can still be found there. So in addition to the gray wolves, uh, there are another 17 different species of carnivorians that live inside of the park. These would include, obviously, your grizzlies um, and the more commonly known uh, American black bear. Common sites of coo uh, not cougar, common sites of coyote, river otter, marten, and badger occur, while there are occasional sightings of cougar, lynx, and wolverine. A number of different rodent species also exist in the park. These would include your yellow-bellied marmot, Least chipmunk, muskrat, beaver, un unita, ground squirrel, pika, snowshoe hare, porcupine, and six different species of bats. Um, of your larger mammals, the most common are your elk. These exist in the thousands. They do have their migration route that goes in between the National Elk Refuge and the Yellowstone National Park. This means that they cross through Grand Teton. Um, and so while you can see them any time of the year, the most common they are is in the spring and fall. Um, other unregulated animals uh, in the park include moose, bison, and pronghorn. 
And then it is also known that the park's moose tend to stay near waterways and wetlands. If you don't want to see a moose, uh, stay away from those. There are between 100 and 125 bighorn sheep that dwell in the alpine and rocky zones of the peaks. Over 300 species of birds have been sighted in the park. These would include your calliope hummingbird as well as trump uh, trumpeter swans. In addition to the trumpeter swans, another 30 different species of waterfowl have been recorded. These would include blue-winged teal, common merganser, American widgeon, and the colorful harlequin duck. Uh, duck. Uh, usually these are spotted in Cascade Canyon. Both bald and golden eagles um, and other birds such as your osprey, red-tailed hawk, American kestrel, and occasionally the peregrine falcon have been reported. There are 14 different species of owls also reported in the park. However, the most common that, they, that people see is the great horned owl. However, there have also been sites of the boreal owl and the great gray owl. There are another dozen species of woodpeckers that have been reported, uh, as well as uh, a similar number of like warblers, plovers? Clovers and gulls. Other birds include the black-billed magpie, sage grouse, brewer sparrow, sage thrashers, great blue heron, American white pelican, sandhill crane, and the whooping crane. You can also find uh, the Snake River fine spotted cutthroat trout, um, and it is the only native trout species in Grand Teton. It is also the only subspecies of the cutthroat trout that is exclusively native to uh, your large streams and rivers. The Snake River find spotted cut tra uh, cutthroat trout is found only in the Snake River uh, and different tri uh, tributaries below the Jackson Lake Dam to the Palisades R Reservoir in Idaho. Other non-native species of trout can be found uh, as the rainbow trout, lake trout, um, and all these were introduced by the Wyoming Fish and Game Department or would eventually migrate out of Yellowstone. Today you can find five different trout species in the park. These would include your mountain whitefish, your long-nosed dace, mountain sucker, and the non-native species include the Utah chub and the arctic grayling. There are only four different species of reptiles that have been documented in the park. These include your three snakes, which are the wandering garter snake, the valley garter snake, and the rubber boa, as well as one lizard species, which is the northern sagebrush lizard. None of these species listed above are considered venomous. Um, there are also six amphibian species that have been documented. These include the Colombian spotted frog, the boreal chorus frog, the tiger salamander, and the rare boreal toad, the northern leopard frog, and the bullfrog. There is an estimated 10,000 insect species that frequent the park. These uh, help pollinate your plants, provide a food source for birds, fish, mammals, and other animals, and they also help in the decomposition of wood. For an example of that, um, there are swarms of army cutworm moth that would die in the park. These swarms would provide high fat and protein to bears and other predators. Um, another thing about the Grand Teton National Park is that it does permit the hunting of elk to help keep the populations regulated. Um, this provision was included in the legislation that would combine Jackson Na Hole National Monument and the Grand Teton National Park in 1950. Uh, in the national park, hunters are required to obtain a Wyoming hunting license and they have to be deputized as park rangers. Hunting is restricted to areas only east of the Snake River and north of Morin, and the hunt is only permitted uh, east of U.S. Route 89. Uh, opponents of continuing the elk hunt, which occurs in the fall, argue that the elk herd would become, not opponents, pro-opponents people who believe in it. Uh, they state that the elk population would become overpopulated without it. This would lead to vegetation degradation from overgrazing elk herds. Opponents of the hunt uh, cite that with an increase of predators such as the wolf and grizzly bear, uh, this would render the hunt unnecessary uh, and leads to the exposing of hunters to attacks by grizzly bears more often than needs to be as the bears would feed on the remains left behind from the hunt. <clears throat> now we focus on the fire ecology. Um, wildfire is actually kind of important in this park. So many of the tree species have evolved to mainly uh, germinate after 
a wildfire. Regions of the park that have experienced wildfire in historical times have a greater species of diversity after reestablishment than those regions that have not been influenced by fire. And then the Yellowstone fires of 1988 had a very minimal impact on the Grand Teton National Park. However, studies conducted before and after, or reaffirmed after that event, concluded that the suppression of national wildfires during the middle part of the 20th century helped decrease plant species diversity and natural regeneration of plant communities. The major uh, collection of conifer species in the Grand Teton National Park are heavily dependent on wildfires, and this is true to the lodgepole pine. Um, although very hot fires um, or crown fires tend to kill lodgepole pine seeds, lower surface fires usually results in a higher post-wildfire regeneration of the species. Another important subject is air and water quality. The park is more than 100 miles from any major urban area and any of the human activities in the park have a very low impact on the region. However, the levels of pneumonium and nitrogen have started to trend upwards due to uh, depositions from rain and snow thought to have come from agricultural activities. There's also been an increase in mercury and pesticides and are believed to have been found in snow and alpine lakes. Ozone and haze is believed to have may, might be impacting overall visibility levels. And then in 2011, the park and other agencies helped erect the first air quality monitoring station. This station is made to check various pollutants and ozone levels and weather. And multiple studies in the waters of the lake uh, showed that it was basically pristine and that the Snake River has very low levels of population. This is probably our quick like our quickest section. It is the climate. Grand Teton National Park is considered a human humid continental climate. Yay, we're done. <laughs> so now we get into the recreation. We're gonna start off with mountaineering, which is one of the biggest. Grand Teton National Park is a very popular destination for mountain and rock climbers. This is usually because the mountains are very easily accessible by road, trails are very well marked, and routes to the summits of most peaks are long established, and for the experienced and fit, most peaks can be climbed in just one day. The highest maintained trails climb from the floor of Jackson Hole over 4,000 feet to mountain passes that are sometimes called saddles or divides. From these passes, the climbs follow routes that require very different skill levels. Um, climbers do not need a permit to climb, however, they are very much incurred that, uh, encouraged that they register their climbing plans with the National Park Service uh, and help inform different associates, so like uh, your parents, anything like that, uh, to your itinerary of what you're doing. Any climbing that is required in overnight stay uh, requires a backcountry permit. Um, climbers are essentially on their own and they have to determine their own skill levels, but are also encouraged not to take unnecessary risks. The Exum Mountain Guides, as well as the Jackson Hole Mountain Guides, offer instructions and climbing escorts for those who believe they are less experienced or unf unfamiliar with various routes. There is an average of 4,000 climbers per, per year that try to attempt to summit Grand Teton, um, and most ascend up Granite, uh, Garnet Canyon to a mountain pass called the Lower Saddle, which is between Grand Teton and Middle Teton. From the lower saddle, climbers often follow the Owen, Spalding, or Exum Ridge routes to the top of the Grand Teton. Uh, there are 38 different distinct routes to the summit. On a connecting ridge and just north of Grand Teton lies Mount Owen, and although it is lower in altitude, this peak is considered to be even more difficult to ascend. Middle Teton is another popular climb that is more easily summited from a saddle between it and South Teton. Uh, north of Grand Teton lies Mount Morin, which is further from trailheads and more difficult to access and ascend. And the direct south uh, butress of Mount Morin provides a vertical mile of climbing that was considered the most difficult climb in the U.S. when first accomplished in 1953. Other popular destinations for climbing include Buck Mountain, Cemetery Spire, Mount St. John, Mount Worcester. Tiwanam Mountain and Nez Pierce Peak, and each of the mountain has at least six established routes in their summits. Now we get into another popular recreation, which is your camping and hiking. 
So Grand Teton National Park has five front country vehicle access campgrounds. The largest is considered to be Coulter Bay and Gross Venture Campgrounds. Each has over 350 campsites, which can accommodate very large recreational vehicles. Lizard Creek and Signal Mountain Campgrounds have over 60 and 86 campsites, while the smaller Jenny Lake Campground has only 49 sites for tent use only. Though all front country campgrounds are open from late spring to late fall, primitive winter camping is permitted at Coulter Bay near the visitor center. All campsites accessible only on foot or by horseback are considered to be backcountry campsites uh, and are only available by permit only. However, camping is allowed in most of the backcountry zones year round. The NPS has a combination of very specific sites and zones for backcountry camping with a very set carrying capacity of overnight stays per zone to help protect the resources from overcrowding. Open fires are not permitted when you go into the backcountry, and all food must be stored in an uh, intra-agency grizzly bear committee approved bear resistant container. Additionally, hikers may only use approved bear spray to help elude aggressive bears. The park has over 200 miles of hiking trails. These range in difficulty from easy to strenuous. The easiest hiking trails are located in the valley where the altitude changes are very generally, are very generally minimal. In the vicinity of Cold Bay Village, the Hermitage Point Trail is 9.4 miles long and considered to be easy. Several other trails uh, link Hermitage Point with Emma Matilda Lake and two Ocean Lake Trails. These are also considered to be very relatively easy hikes uh, in the J Jackson Lake Lodge area. Other easy hikes uh, included the Valley Trail, which runs from Trapper Lake in the north to the south part boundary near Teton Village, and the Jenny Lake Trail, which circles the lake. Ranging from moderate to strenuous in difficulty, trails leading into the canyons are rated based on distance and, more importantly, on the amount of elevation change. The greatest elevation change is found on the Paintbrush Canyon, Alaska Basin, and Gr Garnett Canyon Trails. <clears throat> this is where elevation increases over 4,000 feet are typical. Horses and pack animals are permitted on almost all trails in the park. However, there are only five designated backcountry camping locations for pack animals and these campsites are far from the high mountain passes. Bicycles are limited to vehicle roadways only, and the park has widened some roads to help provide a very safe biking experience. <sighs> a paved multi-use pathway opened in 2009 provides non-motorized biking access from the town of Jackson to South Jenny Lake. Now we get into boating and fishing. So, Grand Teton National Park allows boating on all lakes in Jackson Hole, however, motorized boats can only be used on Jackson and Jenny Lakes. There is no maximum horsepower limit on Jackson, although there is a noise restriction. However, on Jenny Lake, it is restricted to only 10 horsepower. Non-motorized boats are only permitted on Bear Paw, Bradley, Emma Matilda, Leia Phelps, String, Taggart, and Two Ocean Lakes. There are four different designated boat launchers located on Jackson Lake and one on Jenny Lake. Additionally, sailboats, windsurfers, and water skiing are only allowed on Jackson Lake, and no jet skis are permitted on any of the park's waterways. All boats are required to comply with various different safety regulations. These include personal flotation devices for each passenger. Only non-motorized watercraft are permitted on the Snake River, and all other waterways in the park are off-limits to boating, and this includes all alpine lakes and tributary streams of the Snake River. In 2010, Grand Teton National Park started to require every single boat to display an aquatic invasive species decal. This would be issued by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department or by a Yellowstone National Park boat permit. This was an effort to help keep uh, the park waterways free of various different invasive species, such as your zebra mussel and whirling disease. Boaters are expected to abide by different regulations, which include displaying a self-certification of compliance on the dashboard of any vehicle that is attached to an empty boat trailer. The Grand Teton National Park fisheries are managed by Wyoming Fish and Game Department, and a Wyoming state fishing license is required to fish all waterways in Grand Teton National Park. The limit for trout is restricted to six per day. This includes no more than three cutthroat trout uh, that are longer than that are no longer than 12 inches. The maximum length of other trout species may not exceed 20 inches, 
except those taken from Jackson Lake, where they are allowed to be 24 inches. There are also restrictions as to the seasonal accessibility to certain areas, as well as the type of bait and fishing tackle that is permitted. Winter activities. So visitors are also allowed to snowshoe and do cross-country skiing, um, and these are not restricted to trails. The Teton Park Road between the Taggart Lake Trailhead to Signal Mountain Campground is closed to vehicle traffic during the winter, and the section of the road is groomed for skiing and snowshoeing traffic. The Park Service offers different guided snowshoe tours daily from the main headquarters, which is located in Moose, Wyoming. Overnight camping is allowed in the winter in the backcountry with a permit, and visitors should inquire about avalanche dang dangers during the time. The only location in Grand Teton where snowmobiles are permitted is on Jackson Lake, and the NBS requires that all snowmobiles use best available technology, also called BAT, and lists various models of snowmobiles that are permitted, all of which are deemed to provide the least amount of air pollution and maximum noise abatement. All snowmobiles must be less than 10 years old and have odometer readings of less than 6,000 miles. Additionally, snowmobile use is for the purpose of accessing ice fishing locations only. Snowmobile access was permitted between Morin Junction and Flag Ranch adjacent to the John D. Rockefeller Jr. Memorial Parkway so that travelers uh, could use the Continental Divide Snowmobile Trail uh, to traverse between Bridger, Tenton, Bridger Teton National Forest and Yellowstone National Park. However, in 2009, uh, planners closed this since unguided snowmobile access into the Yellowstone National Park was discontinued. Now we focus on the tourism of the area, along with visitor centers. So the Craig, the Craig Thomas Discovery and Visitor Center adjacent to the park headquarters at Moose, Wyoming, is open year-round. It opened in 2007 to help replace an old and adequate visitor center, and the facility was named after the late U.S. Senator Craig Thomas and designed by Bolden Sawinski Jackson. It was financed with a combination of different federal grants and private donations along with a adjoining 154-seat auditorium that was opened to the public in April 2011. The North at Coulter Bay Village on Jackson Lake, the Coulter Bay Visitor Center and uh, Native American Arts Museum is open from the beginning of May to the early October. Uh, the Coulter Bay Visitor Center of Native American Arts Museum housed the David T. Vernon uh, Native American Arts Exhibit since 1972. The Coulter Bay Visitor Center was built in 1956 and was determined in 2005 to be substandard for the proper care and display of the Native American art collection. During the winter of 2011 to 2012, a 150,000 renovation project was completed at the center and a portion of the arts collection was made available for viewing when the center opened for the season in May 2012. South of Moose on the Moose Wilson Road, the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Preserve Center is located on land that was privately owned by Lawrence S. Rockefeller which is situated on Phillips Lake. Donated to the Grand Teton National Park and opened to the public in 2008, the property was once part of the JY Ranch, which is considered to be the first dude ranch at Jackson Hole. At Jenny Lake, the Jenny Lake Visitor Center is open from mid-May to mid-September, and the Visitor Center is within the Jenny Lake Ranger Station Historic District, and is the same structure photographer Harrison Crandall had constructed as an art studio in the 1920s. The park also includes a different amount of accommodations contracted through the National Park Service, various different concessions, uh, which means that they help manage different lodging facilities inside the park exist. The largest su such facility is the Jackson Lake Lodge. It is managed by the Grand Teton Lodging Company. This is located near Jackson Lake Dam. The Jackson, uh, well, no, it's not located near Jackson Lake Dam. The Jackson Lake Lodge is located near the Jackson Lake Dam and has a total of 385 rooms, different meeting facilities, a retail shop, and a restaurant. The Grand Teton Lodge Company also manages the Jenny Lake Lodge, which consists of cabins and a restaurant, the Coulter Bay Village, which has cabins, a restaurant, a grocery store, and a laundry and a marina. South of Jackson Lake Dam, the Signal Mountain Lodge is managed by Forever Resorts. This provides cabins, a marina, a gas station, and a restaurant. And the American Alpine Club has hostel, dormitory-style accommodations. This is primarily reserved for your mountain climbers at the Grand Tetons Climbers Ranch. Adjacent to the Snake River in Moose, Wyoming, Dornan's is an inholding on private land which has a year-round cabin accommodations and related facilities. 
Lodging is also available at the Triangle X Ranch, another private inn holding in the park, and the last remaining dude ranch within park boundaries. So while the park is all fun and dandy and we have we got to see what you can do in the park, it still does have some hazards that come with it. So encountering bears is a very valid concern in the Wind River Range. There are other concerns as well. These include bugs, wildfires, adverse snow conditions, and nighttime cold temperatures. Uh, importantly, there have been different notable incidents. These include your accidental deaths due to falls from steep cliffs, uh, deep or steep cliffs. This could just be a misstep, which could be fatal in the type of terrain that exists in the park. You can all also have incidents that occur due to falling rocks. Um, and over the years, including 1993, 2007, involving an experienced national outdoor service leader, 2015, and 2018. Others' incidents include a uh, seriously injured backpacker being airlifted near Square Top Mountain in 2005 in a fatal hiker incident, which apparently happened from an accidental fall in 2006 that involved state search and rescue, um, and the U.S. Forest Service does not offer updated aggregate records on the official number of uh, fatalities in the Wind River Range. So yes, there are hazards when it comes to this park, but yet again, there are most hazards when you go to parks. You just have to pay attention where you're going and just kind of keep your eyes peeled. Watch what you're doing. Stay safe. And that is that concludes the Grand Tetons. This one was a long one. I could feel my voice losing it, so I'm so sorry if I sound, I sound weird at any point in this. Um, I haven't done a long one like this in forever. So yeah, thank you for sticking with me as we explore the Grand Tetons. And as always, until our next adventure, may your trails be filled with wanderlust, and I will see you guys in the parks. Bye-bye.